welcome back to Spotlight, in which we're answering your questions and we're putting the spotlight on television production. And in this episode, we're going to look at the role of the screenwriter. And so, I am not an expert screenwriter, but I do happen to know who is. Please welcome David Keogh. Yay! Hello, David. Um, so, David, you are a very, I'd say now, very experienced screenwriter. How many scripts have you written in total from the start to today? 30 now, I think. Tell us about generating story ideas. How are story ideas generated? Uh, well, I mean, my first ever screenplay, it wasn't a TV script, but a screenplay, just came from ideas that have been banging around inside my head for years. Um, and interestingly, once I wrote that, I had a clean slate because all my ideas I stuffed into the first one. Um, so uh, it can be from anything. I read newspapers. I think you get little clips often on the news, often the kind of little stories they do at the end um, will be quite quirky and quite interesting. Um, you meet people in life who are a bit odd or strange and you wonder about them and I'm a real people watcher as well. When you're talking about writing it's interesting because I, I think it's quite hard to tell people how to write. How important would you say from your experience script formatting is? Do you think it's quite important? If you read scripts for a living, if you're an agent or if you're a producer, you know how it should look and things will irk you. So if you see something and it's not been done right, it's an immediate warning sign to you that the writer is inexperienced or doesn't know what they're doing. Um, and it can be quite off-putting. So I'll give you one small example. Um, there's something called a cut to, which is a transition. So when you're cutting from one scene to another, lots of people put cut to in after every scene because they're cutting to another scene. But it's implied. You don't need it. It's obvious that you're cutting to another scene. You've started a new scene. And it just looks scrappy. Um, and, that, that, you know, formatting is really important. But it's not just the formatting of, of the titles, the character names, the actions, all of those things. They have to be right. It's making it very clear and very simple for the reader. So when you're looking at actions, they need to be, in your first edit at least, reduced down to the simplest form possible. For television, where would you suggest they start? Would you suggest, let's go into the full 13-part Doctor Who series? Or sh should they start with a one-off or a three-parter? What, what, what would your best advice be? Uh, I would start with a three- or six-parter. Keep it small. Um, unless... Five minute episodes? 45-minute episodes? Uh, I would say page count. about. You can go up to about 57 pages because um, it's not quite... In film, it's about a minute a page but in TV um, it's not quite as much it depends and actually a lot of what you write on TV will get cut out to fit the episode length anyway we have those are things that writers have to do right so not just writing the story in fact actually writing the story may be the the most fun part of this process um, but then they have to find an agent uh, because really without an agent they're gonna you know struggle to attract uh, more senior producers, even new producers, because they want to negotiate those things. So how does a writer go about, all right, you've written a three-part screenplay or for television, it's brilliant, you love it. Do you have to continuously keep writing, getting your stuff out there to attract agents? Or should the writer be constantly emailing agents all the time? Writing is much like acting in the respect that if you are well-known, if you are the son of someone, if you are from a privileged background, if you don't have to do a day job to eat, if you know, there are lots of reasons why a lot of people will be able to get into TV. So what you have to do, and what I did, and whether it works for everybody, I don't know, is write, get feedback, write, get feedback, write, get feedback, and get one good script. Whether it's TV or film, it doesn't matter, just have one thing that's good but you have to take on the feedback and listen to people when they give it to you, even if it hurts to do. Mm. Um, as long as it's consistent feedback, which is why you ask three or four people who, who make films, ideally, not people who don't. So don't give it to your mate or your dad or your, your mum. Give it to someone who makes films or makes TV or has made short films or just someone who knows films. And there are lots of people out there. Write one thing that's good and just keep getting it right until you're really comfortable. It's a great script. And then you, you enter that into competition. While that's, or sending it to agents, that's what you do. You have to do the emails. The other key thing though is don't send things which people don't want. 
you know, you need to know what people want out there. Um, what are people looking for? You know, there's going to be, after the coronavirus has lifted, for example, which we're all in at the moment, I don't know when people are watching this, but um, there will be a sudden requirement for scripts about isolation and all of those sorts of things. And for years, we're going to be seeing depressing movies about people being stuck at home. Oh, no. Um, I know. So you've got a choice. You can either write stuff which is going to fit that genre or you can do what was bound to be a bounce back is make positive, happy scripts, things that people are going to want to watch. So, for example, I'm writing a Christmas movie for someone at the moment. You're right. I think that's a key thing about writing. You've got to stick to what you enjoy writing because actually, um, I don't know if you've done this, but I've certainly done this where I've then veered off and tried to write something else. And although it's been all right, actually, not only has it not interested me that much, but I know it will now just sit on a shelf forever because I'm never going to give it to anyone. Because even if somebody was interested, I don't think I'd be that interested. But what you can do, a way to spur yourself if you're not very good at having ideas, is find people who do have ideas. A lot of your writing as a screenwriter is going to be for free for your first few years. You're going to be writing for people knowing you're not going to make any money from it. But you might get a short film made. You might get someone who likes your script. You might get someone who likes your short film script and decides, OK, I quite like that short film script. Um, I wonder if he could adapt this script that someone gave me that I don't really like very much. And um, what three of the films that I've written have been other people's scripts where they've been quite bad scripts, but there's a core of a decent story. And the director or the producer has liked the story, but hasn't actually liked the script very much. But you've got to get your stuff out there. You've got to, and, and actually writing short films is a really good way of getting your stuff made because there's loads of low budget filmmakers looking for quirky little short films to make. You've written your script. You've, you're happy yeah. with your baby. You've, your agent's happy with your baby. You've got your stuff out there and a producer's approached you and said, I, I really like this. Um, obviously, the first thing you're going to do is meet with your producer, um, who's going to figure out, as we explained in another video, all about the copyright and everything like that, get all that sorted and get the sort of legal side. And then they're going to look at giving you an option. A lot of producers are very, you know, especially new ones, are very inexperienced about giving notes to writers. What, what makes a good, could you just give us a couple of examples of good notes to writers? I'll tell you what makes bad notes first. Okay, yeah. Snarky, snarky comments. Um, I, I'll give you one example. Um, I, can I, I, I can't swear on this, right, but I'll use the word. I, one of my characters in my screenplay said the word S-H-I-T, um, and it was set in 415 AD in, in um, Britain. And the person reading it went, oh, well, actually, um, the, they wouldn't have used that word back then. It was derived from a French word in the 12th century. So, uh, 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 uh. And, uh, my response back was like, hang on, mate, they didn't even speak English. They spoke Britonic. I'm making this up. It's a story. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that back then they will have had a word for that in their language. So... Yeah, but people love picking up on small things. And there are pernickety people who aren't proper screenwriters themselves, have never had anything done, but they're great at standing on a little soapbox and telling you how bad <laughs> it is. That is really bad feedback. Now, often, within their bad feedback, there's some good stuff, which if that's why you need to go to three or four people, because um, you need to sort of see the consistent bits between this, the feedback and take only those out and change them. You don't change something because you've got a snarky person saying do it differently. So the best thing you can do is be positive, but don't, don't gloss over the bad stuff. So I literally, when I give notes, I go through it, and I'm, I'm, my, my producer does this to me as well. In fact, all the people that I write with have this approach. They send my screenplay back and they send a Word document, say page one, scene three, um, try saying this instead. That character doesn't sound, wouldn't do that. Um, change this scene around. How about we make this character a female because actually you've written too many males in this. And, and, and you, you go through and you do that and, and you suggest big things. I, I've, I've read some scripts and I've had some of my scripts read where there are plot holes in it and you don't see it. When you're writing, you do not see the plot hole, but someone else reading it goes, there's no way that can be there. No. It was blown up in episode, you know, in, in the first five minutes. And you're like, Argh! A producer knows when a relationship with the director isn't working. You know, when they meet them for the first time and they show them the script because the director's read the script and they go, um, 
Oh, actually, yeah, this is a great script. And I let's add a helicopter in, and let's add an explosion in here, yeah. and uh, you know, let's let's have the bridge collapse at this point. And the producer goes, "Yeah, but it's set in 1385. You know, there are no helicopters. I'm really sorry, there aren't any bridges either." But at what point is a writer not, you know, no? What point does the writer suddenly think, "Oh, this relationship isn't working"? It works both ways as well. I mean, the producer might be sick of you, so let me tell you how to make sure you're not the bad guy in the conversation. Um, when you send your first draft to a producer, you will have to change, except from day one, you'll have to change at least half of it. Yeah. Um, but what happens is the next time you send it in and it comes back, you only have to change 30% of it, and then you have to change 20% of it, and it gets easier, and each redraft gets easier. I'm currently writing a one-hour drama, which has got eight episodes. We've written the first episode, and I'm on the 16th draft, but the last five drafts, have just been, oh, hang on a minute, we're now going to do this in episode three. Therefore, we need to change this in episode one. So you have to go back and just tweak it and twiddle it a bit. And that's a constant process. Um, if it's the other way around and you're working for a producer that's absolutely crazy and they're asking for things which, you know, you just, you don't want to do. Well, if you've been paid, kind of tough. Um, if you want to keep the money from what you've been doing you and you've already been paid, you need to do what the director's asking for. Now, let's cut to the chase and ask our final question, which is the one that everyone will want an answer to. And it's, you know, it's the most asked questions when I go to these writers' conferences, and directors' conferences. You know, it's the one question we get asked the most. You ready for this? Yeah. Okay, is there any money in it? It's speculative. You cannot be a writer in isolation. You need another job uh, when you start. Um, unless you've got a trust fund or you can afford to sit at home where you have a spouse who allows you to um, write all day. Um, you, you, know, you, need, uh, you need to either focus on doing a lot of writing and spend all your time getting it out there. And that means emailing scripts to people, emailing agents, emailing producers, emailing directors, um, doing crazy things like I sent one of my scripts to Mel Gibson in three different addresses that I found on the system just to ho in hope that he might get one of them and it cost me a fortune. So you will not make money as a writer, let's be absolutely clear. However, you can if you get into, you can become a team writer on EastEnders or on Holby City or one of those shows, um, then you can make a living from it. It won't be a lot, but you can make a living. You, you have to believe in yourself and keep trying. And, and actually, most of this job, and it's the same being an actor as I'm an actor as well, is rejection and living with rejection. Um, 99%, not, not even 95, 99% of the time people say no to you and you feel that you're not good enough and you feel self-doubt and you feel like you, you aren't very good and you doubt everything you've written and you doubt your acting. Um, uh, and then you have to wake up the next morning and do the same thing over and over yeah. again. Don't lose hope. Don't, don't, don't lose hope. But remember, viewers, what, I mean, wherever, you're, wherever you start, and then David's just put it there, you ain't going to make any money, so just do it for the love of it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but... If you write for the love of it, the writing will be better. Absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, David, for joining us on Spotlight. Good luck with your next screenplay. Thank you. <laughs> and have fun. And that's it for today. Thank you for joining me.